Welcome back to the Family Movie Night Podcast. My name is Nathan, and in honor of the movies that we are discussing today, we are going back to high school, going back to childhood to talk about some uh, great coming-of-age movies. Uh, I wanted to ask every person, every one of our hosts here, to Google their uh, the year they graduated high school and what was the song that was number one on the Billboard charts, their birthday of that year. So mine is March 2nd, 2008. What was the number one song? And if that number one song on the Billboard charts was the theme song of your life, how accurately would it describe your life? Let's start with, of course, the hero of our podcast, Mr. Donnie Dorsey. Donnie, what was the number one song on the Billboard charts, your birthday, the year you graduated high school? So the number one song on the Billboard charts on my birthday in 2002, uh, 2002 when I graduated was Lose Yourself by Eminem. Dude, oh, that's, yes. that, that's a killer song for you, man. That's <laughs> that awesome. way cooler than my answer. Oh. <laughs> I think that's perfect. I, Donnie, I think it per perfectly describes your life because you always have uh, arms heavy and, and knees weak and your arms are sweaty. I mean, yeah. you're... <laughs> And I'm always trying to figure out what's in mom's spaghetti so I can like yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 you it's always got to figure out mom's spaghetti. spaghetti. <laughs> All right. So very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and talk to the villain of our podcast, Sawyer Hewlett. What was the number one song on your birthday? Oh, man. I wish I had a cool answer like Donnie. The answer to that is See You Again by Wiz Khalifa. Is that and the Paul Walker song? That's the song? Paul Walker yep. Fast and Furious do, 7 do, do, song. Do, 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 when I'll do, do, do. see you again. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, very good. I, I, uh, that, is, that is not very good. That is not the theme song to my maybe, life it, Maybe all. it is because maybe you're going to <laughs> die today. Maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe one of my best friends is going to die. That's right. Soon. You got to drive off into the sunset. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, very man. good. And I will just CG animate your face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. All right. And then, of course, uh, Heidi Cooper joining us again. Heidi, what was the number one song uh, your birthday the year you graduated high school? Oh, so good. It was You Got It Bad by Ursher. Oh, oh there and you that go. is totally me because I'm so like in my feelings all the time. I always got it bad. Yeah, I got I'm it. Always, I'm yeah. always sweating something, obsessing over something. <laughs> Very good. All right. I've, I've been waiting to tell because I knew Donnie would love this. The number one song, my theme song for my life, number one song, my birthday, 2008, is Low by T-Pain. <laughs> Donnie got low. Because <laughs> I do have them apple bottom jeans and the boots with the fur. <laughs> the whole club's <laughs> always looking at me. So. Oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Apple bottom jeans and face with the fur. Episode 19 of the Family Movie Night Podcast, where we want to help your family have better conversations around the content you consume. And today we're actually doing like a themed episode. We all watch different movies that kind of fit into uh, when I was in English class in college. They would have called it the Buildings Romans genre. Uh, movies about identity formation and coming of age and movies about people kind of at that time of life, uh, you know, late uh, middle school, high school, where college, where you're kind of figuring out who am I, right? What's my identity? So we're watching a lot of high school movies, a lot of uh, uh, kids movies about figuring about a new kid moving to town and figuring out where they fit. Uh, that's what we've got going on for today. We'll talk about that in a little bit more. But right now, Donnie, why don't you tell them what we do on this podcast? Yeah, so on this podcast, we encourage every family, community, Christian church to have a monthly movie night to help you and your children build memories and start conversations that matter. The goal of our family ministry is to help you raise your children to love Jesus and his way of life above all other things. And we know that critical to that is for you to have a routine, regular time of connection and shared experiences that help you build stronger relationships. And, uh, you know, we, we believe that uh, movie nights are like this really good way 
it's a great opportunity to do that because movies aren't just like this easy way to like share laughter and joy and you know even fear and sadness in, in a safe environment but you know like i think that like they give us this chance to talk about like what matters to us in a way that is meaningful and memorable and safe with our children uh and you know on this podcast we we don't just want to recommend some movies you could watch on your monthly movie night um lots of people do that um but we want to give you some ideas of meaningful conversations that you could have with your children during or especially after the movie and as always the point of this podcast is not to add one more thing that you as parents need to feel guilty about that you're not doing, we want to make it easier for you and your kids to enjoy being together so that you can build memories and have conversations that matter. So throughout our conversation today, remember that we want you to have fun and we want you to help. We want to help you think through simple and easy ways to share the love of Jesus with your kids. And uh, we actually want to hear from you guys as well. Uh, we want this to not just be a one-sided conversation. Uh, in the link of this video, I mean, the description of this video or the podcast you're listening to, you'll see a link to a form called What We're Missing. And, you know, if there's a movie that you want us to discuss, in fact, one of the movies that I watched for this was actually a recommendation from a listener of this podcast. If you want to recommend a movie for us, you can do that in that description. Or if there's something we've talked about that you want to add to the conversation, you had some ideas that you wanted us to discuss, you can put that in there. We may do an episode talking about that. Or maybe you've got questions about how do you talk about certain kinds of things in movies like violence or maybe even like sexual content. How do you have those conversations with your kids? We want to have those conversations with you. So let us know. But that link in the form, that's the place to do that. But Let's talk real quick about what we mean when we talk about coming-of-age movies. Uh, I know if you've got teenagers or really older kids, uh, you're probably watching some movies that are like high school movies, right? In the 80s, it was The Breakfast Club, and it's really about, like, how do you figure out who you are, your unique place in the world, right? The Karate Kid is a great 80s movie about figuring out new kid moving to town and figuring out who he is. Uh, by figuring out this talent and this kind of place he fits in the world. And uh, all of us watched a different one of these kind of movies. And uh, we just wanted to recommend some good versions of this. But here's the truth. I know you guys are going to be watching all different kinds of high school movies with your kids. Or if you're not, your high schoolers are watching high school movies. So we want to talk about how do you talk about these things. So first up, let's just go ahead and talk about what movies did we watch. So Donnie, why don't you start us off? What movie did you watch when we talked about coming-of-age movies? So I watched Mixtape. Uh, it was, uh, And this was the movie, just for people to know, this is the movie that was recommended. Someone saw it on Netflix. This is a Netflix original movie, and they said, you guys should watch this movie and talk about it. And I wanted to do a bigger topic than this, but Donnie, I watched Mixtape. You said you watched it. I did. Uh, what did you feel about? Tell them a little bit about what Mixtape is about. Okay, so the the Mixtape is about um, this this young girl that um, at the age of two, her her parents died, and so she's been living with her her grandmother, um, and it's about ten years ten years past um, since they died, um, and she is just trying to reach and find a connection to her parents to find some identity in who she is to kind of know who where she came from and she ends up finding this mixtape that her parents made for each other and she goes on this kind of journey right to to figure out what are these songs so she starts going to this um this like record uh shop and this takes place like in 99 right yeah i think so yeah, it takes place in 1999, and it's these 12-year-old girls, and th she ends up building friends as she's doing it. She's trying to like be able to recreate the mixtape because, as many cassette tapes did, it got torn, and this was past the point uh, towards the end of the 90s, obviously. Most of us had CD players, not cassette players anymore, although my dad had a cassette player in the car. So we had one of those, you put the cassette in, and it connects to your CD Walkman that you have to like gently nudge somewhere so that it doesn't skip too much while you're driving. We had one of those. But yeah, they're trying to recreate it. And like you said, she's trying to find her identity in this connection with her parents and she ends up finding her identity more in these friends that she has around her and trying to work all that in. So yeah, it's a did, Donnie. Did you enjoy the movie? I did. Um, I thought like when I first like kind of was starting, I was like, okay, let's see where this is going to go. 
but it definitely did a really good job of telling the story and really getting into that the psyche of the of that age it was very much it felt like they were doing a really good job of telling the story through her eyes well and it's so here's what i'll say in in, as far as like objectionable content i I think it's rated pg but i can't remember it's pretty there's not really much language in it Mm -hmm. not almost any sexual content there's not even much of a romance in the movie um and it's uh, my girls watched it they had a really good time it skews a little younger maybe middle school and really like my my 10 year old i think it was one of those like you know when you were in middle school and you watched high school movies like imagining what high school was i think this was her kind of imagining like what's it like to be 12 and yeah. what's it like to you know do that so uh very similar to the movie i watched which i think fits content wise in the same place which is the sand lot which I think most people have seen before uh, from the nineties, right? This movie about a young boy that moves to a town in the, I think it's like the fifties. He doesn't have any friends. He has a new stepdad and he doesn't really know where he fits. He ends up joining this kind of sandlot league of kids that are just playing baseball all the time. And uh, a lot of hilarity ensues as he ends up having to go on this adventure to rescue a ball that was signed by Babe Ruth. That was his stepdad's ball that got knocked over a fence where a beast lives and uh, very much has those kind of Stephen King stand by me vibes of just young kids getting into stuff. And he really starts to find his identity in this group of friends. He learns who he is by the people that are around him. Uh, it's a lot of fun. If if you grew up with it, I'm guessing everyone here has seen The Sandlot. Is that correct? Yes. Everyone, yeah, everyone's shaking their head. So if you have a free form, uh, uh, if you have cable and you have free form or what used to be ABC Family, this thing is playing all the time on there. So your kids will probably want to watch it. Uh, this is a good one for that. It's a lot about identity formation. All right, Heidi, what what movie uh, are are you discussing for this podcast? Mean Girls from two thousand four. Oh yeah, I went and saw yep. Mean Girls in the theaters when I was in middle school. So there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, so Mean Girls is about a girl who moves um, from South Africa to the United States, and she ends up kind of just getting into this culture that she's totally unfamiliar with, and is so different from everything that she's experienced, but totally normal to what our kids would experience. I think. Um, especially at that time in their, you know, in that era. Um, <clears throat> but still today, it's just like more dramatized, you know, it's even yeah. bigger now. The groups, the bullying is online and all that stuff. So yeah, it's definitely one that, um, that I think could be really fun to watch with your kids, uh, older kids. Um, yeah. And, you know, kind of uh, see the, it. it's definitely, very dramatized, you know, what happens to like the villains and things like that. But um, it's also kind of the, you know, usually how life goes, how it usually ends up going if you're really unkind and, you know, um, pick on people and mean to people, things like that. Well, and Mean Girls is such an interesting uh, example of, of, and I think it's kind of a, it obviously is kind of mocking some high school movies yeah. in kind of the way, because it's, it's Tina Fey, who I think most people know, but Saturday Night Live, uh, and then eventually 30 Rock and, you know, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. She's obviously this very satirical writer with everything she does. So she's kind of poking fun at the template of these high school movies, uh, but does so in such a way that, especially like 2003, 2004, really felt incredibly relevant felt like this is exactly what everyone's feeling i think it still very much fits but like you said there's not a lot of smartphones or social media because it just wasn't an issue at the time but i know that this movie has become a cultural touch point even now still middle schoolers and high schoolers watch this movie uh, Mm -hmm. and quote it and talk about it and this movie is so good in that it starts with a girl who clearly knows who she is. She was homeschooled. She grew grown up. Her parents were like these uh, medical missionary type people, right? They were like with the doctors without borders kind of thing in Africa. And she had kind of grown up um, knowing clearly like, this is who I am. I'm smart. I'm capable. I'm all this stuff. But she starts kind of pursuing being popular. She thinks being popular will be her identity or like this friend group of the mean girls will be her identity. And she ends up acting. She starts acting dumb. She starts uh, being mean, being unkind, being pretty spiteful, becomes a person she doesn't want to be in the pursuit of an identity that she thinks she wants. 
And I think that becomes a person that she's not, like you said, you know, she really, those things are not actually true to her character or what she enjoys, but she thinks that that's, what's going to get her to where she wants to be. And the boys and the, you know, all those things, the recognition and things like popularity that, that she feels is more important than just being herself. Yeah. I mean, it is like a proverbial Greek tragedy for the modern era. I mean, it really is like, it is the thing every kid faces is like, who am I going to be in high school? Who am I going to be as an adult? And that pursuit can often be the thing, that ambition can be the thing that is your downfall. Um, yeah. And the adult characters are almost as, like, yeah. as <laughs> valuable. <laughs> when you watch it as a, you know, middle-aged adult yeah. versus watching it, like, back in 2004 when I was a lot younger <laughs> I mean, than I am now. How many of us are just quoting Mean Girls all the time? I, mean, I regularly will say, she doesn't even go here all the time. <laughs> I regularly say, get in, losers, we're going shopping. I like yeah. to <laughs> regularly say that. That's the best best one. All right, Sawyer, what movie did you watch? And tell us a little bit about uh, the identity behind it. Yeah, I watched a movie called uh, The Way, Way Back, which is, uh, it's so just to, like give a little setup. It's about this kid named Duncan who is, going to spend like this just sounds so miserable and that's kind of like where the premise grabbed me i was like oh that sounds like a really fun miserable time because it's about this kid who is going to spend the summer at the beach house that is owned by his mom's boyfriend he's going to be there with her her his potential future stepfather and his potential future stepsister okay and he doesn't want to be there he wants to be with his dad um and basically the the journey of of, that he goes on throughout the movie is kind of this discovery that i can actually not be miserable kind of um i can i might have to work hard to get out of the situation that i'm currently in but i can find people to love and that will love me regardless of where i'm at is the thing if i'm just willing to look there are going to be people trying to love me and stuff like that. And there's this character played by Sam Rockwell, who's like kind of a loser, but at the same time, he's the one that decides I'm going to love this kid. Well, and it's really beautiful and stuff like that. He makes some friends along the way. It's one of the last movies starring Anna Sophia Robb, who is my first celebrity crush because she's my age. So uh, was, that was the qualifications. Uh, yeah, dude. I was, <laughs> okay. I was trying to be watching, I gotta okay? find a girl my age who's in movies. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. But uh, I was I was such a weird junior hire. Anyway, um, but no, uh, it was it was a really good movie because I also it was one of the the first like coming of age movies that I saw as more than just like Ferris Bueller's Day Off and stuff like that, which isn't really even a coming of age story. Um, this one was really helpful honestly like because i also relate to duncan a lot you know he's a very quiet awkward kid um very kind of reclusive and so uh, the care the main character duncan is a very relatable character i think yeah well and it's a really it's a little more nuanced uh was this your first time having watched the way way back no i've seen it several times i saw it back yeah. when i was uh like a senior in high school i think was the first time i saw it Gotcha. Yeah. It's a little more nuanced uh, in that it's it's trying to take some of these kind of stereotypes of the kind of movies we've been talking about and try and do it differently. I will say it and not really necessarily for content. Once again, you can go to IMDb and uh, look at the parents guide for all these movies to be able to tell content what you think is right for your family. I don't remember the way way back being like having a lot of bad content, but it the the themes of it are a little more mature like i don't think my kids would re- really relate to anything in this movie no i i, I would agree. say it's on the older end yeah i would definitely say that i would also say you know on the content side one of the central um conflicts is that there is an affair going on right and so that might that. you know you might not want to introduce that to your nine year old yeah, younger kids yeah <laughs> yeah and i will you, say it never it's never explicit but it's very much like yeah, this guy's cheating on, right on this person. Also, Steve Carell plays the villain, the the future stepdad, which he just hams it up, and it's awesome. Even though you you're never like, come on, Steve Carell is not the villain. You, you, you right. never think that he he sells it very well. 
I will say this movie does have my one of my first celebrity crushes, which is Allison Janney. Uh, <laughs> who played CJ Craig on West yeah. Wing? The West Wing. <laughs> so that was one of mine when I was nine. That's the weird I was. I was like, wow, she's really smart. She <laughs> she really knows how to handle that press room. So that was my that was my uh, celebrity crush at a young age. Okay, so let's get to kind of the themes we want to talk about. Here's really what I want to uh, surround this on. We talked about this a little in our last episode, which is that as parents, especially as Christian parents, when we're watching these movies, we're going to have to take the conversation beyond what this movie is going to do, because these movies are not made from a kingdom of God perspective. And so sometimes even the kind of good things that the movies hit on, they don't go far enough. And so like you take a movie like Mean Girls, which kind of tackles like, is my identity going to be found in popularity, right? Is it going to be found in how cool I am? Or is it I just need to be true to myself? Right. That's one kind of thing. Like, is identity something I find for myself or do I find it in my popularity? And the movie kind of lands on, hey, you kind of need to know who you are, be true to yourself and be kind to other people. Now, those are good things. Those are none of those are bad things, but they don't go far enough. Right. Neither does a movie like Mixtape or a movie like The Way Way Back or The Sandlot, which all kind of wrestle with where do you find your identity? as believers and as parents who are trying to raise children to love Jesus and his way of life, we ultimately want them to find their identity in Christ. And that idea is one of those things people I think talk about a lot, but we don't know how to talk about that with our kids. So I want to kind of begin this conversation by actually reading some scripture to you uh, that comes from Colossians. Colossians is a letter written by the apostle Paul to a church in a place called Colossae. And there was a church there And he said this to them. Uh, This is Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, strive for the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ, with Christ, in God. Now, that's already kind of difficult to understand. So I want to read you a different translation. This is called the Passion Translation, and I think it'll be a good setting for our conversation. This is Colossians 3 from the the Passion Translation. Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ is, sitting enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realms and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. This right here, I think, is what we're trying to get our children to. And this is the conversation I want to have. When we watch these kind of movies, there is a part of us One that resonates because we all know what it's like to try to find our identity in popularity or in romance, some kind of boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, especially in high school, right? Uh, Or in some kind of talent. There's a movie out that's um, nominated for an Academy Award. Uh, It's called uh, CODA, uh, Children of Deaf Adults. And it's about a, a girl who grows up in a family where everyone else is deaf. She is not. And she is a, a beautiful singer And the whole point of the movie really gets to, hey, I know you have this family and you have responsibilities here, but you need to be true to yourself and true to your talent and that your talent, that's your identity. Your identity is you're a beautiful singer. And she has to kind of wrestle with that. Now, there are some things about that that very much resonate with all of us. But the conversation we need to have is how do we have a conversation with our kids, maybe using these movies, right, Mean Girls and Mixtape and all these things of, What does it actually look like as a teenager to have my identity in Christ? Does anyone want to kind of start that conversation of of what does it look like to have that conversation with our kids and maybe some of the stuff that they're going through? So anybody want to start there? So I'll start with this. Um, With Mean Girls, you know, I kind of mentioned how the um, adults in the movie, they are just, I feel like just as important and really important. like driving the message home because, you know, you see um, the teachers uh, really insecure and then the Regina George, Miss George, um, 
Amy Poehler is, she's like, I'm not just a regular mom. I'm a cool mom, you know? (laughs) And like her, so it kind of shows how like insecurities and like trying to figure out how we can, you know, be accepted is something that like this mom is, is trying to be accepted by her teenage daughter, you know, (laughs) Regina George, and she's bullied by her. And the mom's identity is in the daughter, you know, like, I'm not just a regular mom. I'm a cool mom because my daughter's cool. So as long as I act cool and make her happy, then I'm a cool mom and I'll be popular with a bunch of teenage kids. And it's like, you know, that seems really silly, but we all kind of do that. Like, you know, no matter how young or old we are, we struggle with these insecurities of like, where does my identity lie? But if we know that our identity is in Christ and we know that it's not that that there's nothing in this world that will uncover, unveil something, you know, so significant that we'll see, okay, so it's not in, in the birth of my children and I have now become a mother. Those are those are roles that we play, but our identity is that we are children of God. We are, mm-hmm. you know, co-heirs with Christ. These are our identities. So if we kind of stick with identity being like central to what we know God has, you know, Jesus has told, showed us and God has told us in his word, then all these other things are roles that we play for seasons, but we don't get so caught up that like, you know, when they're gone, what do we do? You know, like parents with empty nesting, like you see it even in, in that age. I mean, it, it feels like, well, if I'm not that child's parent anymore, if I'm not doing, you know, things of care, you know, driving them around or this, that, or whatever, that I'm not as important as I used to be. And that's, you know, obviously not the truth. It's not that that's not the significant thing that you'll do with your life. Um, it just feels that way, you know, in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's huge, Heidi. I think that's huge. I think especially for kids and teens, especially it's very easy to kind of identify yourself with a role, like you said, and this is who I am because this is what I do. Um, and there's so much more to us than that. Donnie, it looks like you want to say something. What, what do you got to add? Yeah, I was um, I was thinking about like in the context of like uh, the movie mixtape, like the grandmother um, is having to take on a role that she, of course, never intended to. And so she's really trying to find out how do I fill this particular role? How do I identify with this young girl that is my kid's kid? And also be able to handle all the things that are going on. And so, like, she kind of goes through the motions at times, like, where she's just kind of, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And then you watch that, in a way, you can see how um, the main character, Bev, kind of sees that. And she's watching that. And, like, she's like, well, well, maybe I need to find something. I got yeah. to search for something. I have to identify with something. Because when she goes to school, you know, she's she's kind of a little bit of an outcast. And, like, but she has... Her, you know, her select few of people that she started to build relationships with. And like you can see it like in the parents that you just even have brief interactions with. Like um, I'm trying to remember um her name. Let's see. Uh I think it was Ellen. Ellen's mom, like, is very protective. So, mm-hmm. and a lot of it is in the fact of she's just trying to her idea is that okay we are supposed to be this, like we have to be protected. We have to be smart. We have to be all these things because you hear it in how the daughter responds about things and how she talks about herself and how she talks about her mom, you know? And like, even with uh, like the older friend that they make uh, friends with is Nikki. Mm -hmm. Like she, you see her in a lot of light of what people think of her. And to a certain extent, she tries to embody it. And she holds on to it until she leaves the space of other people. And when she gets the opportunity to see it from someone else going, hey, wait a minute. Um, I don't have to be that. I can be myself. You know, and I think a lot of times that's the thing we miss. Um, Like when we're trying to find like when people are like explaining to their kids about their identity in Christ or like they're trying to figure out how do I tell you like, well, you don't have this gift or you don't have this gift or you don't have this. And it's like it's not about that. It's about what are you doing to build the kingdom of God? That's your identity. What, what, what things are you adding to, you know, are you the person that people go to for comfort? Are you the person that people are willing to listen to? Like that brings wisdom. Or are you the person that literally just listens and makes people comfortable enough to share 
the things that are going on. And I think it's easy to get lost in, you know, the idea of, well, I have to be kind of like what Heidi was talking about with the mom is like, I have to be the cool parent or I have to be the cool kid. I have to be all these things, yeah. you know, but if you identify like, okay, I just need to be someone that adds value to the kingdom of God in the overall scope of things. And then if we do that and we communicate that to our kids, like, like Heidi was talking about, as we go through the stages, the changes of life and where we are in those different seasons, then it becomes more apparent. Like, okay, look, I don't have to be just this this role. I don't have to identify with just this role. Things will change. Things will adapt. Things will evolve. And that's okay, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think what you're getting at, Donnie, that I think is huge is, and I think Henri Nowen is the first person that I heard really talk about this, but the idea behind it, I think he's a Belgian priest, and he talked about um, that when when Jesus was being tempted in the um, – in the desert that the three temptations he really faces are the three ways we all, all human beings find their identity. It either is I am what I do. So I am what I can do, what I can achieve, what I can accomplish my talents. I am what I have. So I become the kind of person who thinks my possessions, you know, how much money I have, how much, how many friends I have, how many, all this different kinds of stuff. what I possess is what I am, or I am what others say of me. Uh, and what what other people say about me are my three things. And he says that what Jesus is rejecting in all three of those things is I'm not what other people say. I'm not what I have. I'm not the position, the authority I have. I am not what I do. What I am is I am a child of God. That Jesus, just before he goes into the wilderness, is baptized. And as baptism, God comes in a heavenly voice and says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And that that becomes his identity, that what my identity is. And that's really what we want. I mean, isn't that what we want for our kids when we see our kids being so insecure or so self-conscious? I just want to grab my little girls and go, I know, I know you want to be beautiful and you are beautiful. And I know that you want to be tough and you want to be strong and you want to be funny and you want to be all these things, but you are so much more than all of that. What you ultimately are is you're loved by me. You're loved by me. And ultimately you're loved by Jesus that you you are loved. And I think one thing that becomes so difficult for our children, and especially by the time they get to teenage uh, hood, I don't know what she said, but time they become a teenager is that that doesn't feel like it's enough. And that becomes the central lie. The fact that I am loved by God or loved by my parents or loved by other people, that's not enough. I need to do something. I need to have something. I need to, I need to, I need other people to acknowledge it and say it about me. Um, that to be true. Um, so kind of to piggyback off what both of you said is like Donnie, you were talking about, you know, um, you, you, add value to the kingdom of God. Like you, that is, that is your identity. And I think like you can even take it back a step further, you know, and, and um, from what you said, Nathan, and you, your, your identity is secure from the moment you entered this world because right. God put you here with a purpose. And so if we are from the time, you know, our kids are very small, reminding them that, the God of the universe, who is who's the most intentional and knows the most, chose this time, this space, this body, this hair, this, you know, friend group, this parent, you know, my daughter, she's six, barely six. And she's already, I don't know if I, if I am belong in this family. Mm. And I'm like, okay, we've been watching Encanto a little bit too much, but, <laughs> <laughs> but also it's this, um, this search for identity, search for belonging that is innate in all of us. And so if we can start from, from, uh, from before they can remember is always just my goal is like to just remind them, like your identity doesn't lie in any person or anything that is here. You know, it doesn't matter if you are a sporty kid or if you're a, you know, quote unquote nerdy kid or if you're, you know, whatever you are, if you're a boy or if you're a girl, if you're not sure, you know, and you think you're, you know, you think you don't don't have that part figured out like you were born and created in the image of God. And that's incredible. And then also with this specific purpose in mind, and he's given you an opportunity to to live out that purpose here. So I think that kind of 
if you can, if you can connect that with kids and yeah. have that just be the basis of truth, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Donnie, were you going to say something? No, I just, I mean, I definitely would echo everything you said. I mean, I think that's so critical is to do it early. Cause I think yeah. a lot of parents wait until their children are able to communicate back. And I remember someone telling me um, before is that kids can um, often can't communicate as much as they understand mm -hmm. because while they may not be able to tell you, they can communicate it through their actions, their feelings and how they emote things. Yeah. And that's the, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good, Donnie. Cause if you, um, if you wait until they're verbalizing it in a way that you understand exactly what's happening inside them, then that's already taken root. You know, those insecurities and those, you know, those things have already have, are, they're already a thing in them. Yeah. And then, you know, to go back to what you said, Nathan, then parents have this, um, you know, kind of, <laughs> um, tendency to say, well, no, that's no, that's silly. Why would you think something like that? Like it's just an, a you know a, a thought that just dawned on them and they're verbalizing it. You know, unless you have a really externally processing kid, then that's probably not the case. They've been thinking on this for a little while. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think so. He, just get to kind of to kind of wrap all this up. Um, I think one of the most damaging things that exists in our culture uh, is this idea that you need to figure yourself out or you need to find yourself. Um, and it's really damaging for, for, for young people, for kids and teenagers, because where do I do that? It sounds like my identity is somewhere out here among all these people or among something I can do, have, or what others say about me. And I got to go find it out there somewhere. And that'll tell me who I am. And as a parent, that's kind of terrifying because I don't know who they're going to find that's going to tell them who they are. Uh, and that's not the best idea, but it's also not okay to just go very internal with that because. What's in my brain and what's in my heart are not always good for me. And most of the time they're not. And finding who I am by figuring out what works for me isn't best. What Colossians 3 said is your identity is hidden in Christ. It's in God. And that if we can help our kids pursue Jesus, they will find themselves by looking at him. It's that thing of when a, when a parent holds a child, a baby, and they look into the face, and the ba the, mo the mom and dad spend more time smiling at that baby, trying to get the baby to smile back, because the baby's eyes aren't properly formed yet and can't really see. They can't really see the face. And then one day, by looking at the mom's face, they see, I am loved, I am accepted, I am taken care of. And that's when they start to light up and smile themselves. And that it's by looking at their mother's loving face that they see themselves. And it's by us looking at Christ's face and knowing Christ and his love for us. It's us living in that way that we see who we are. And that's what we want for our kids. And I want to throw this last thing out and then we'll be done, which is this. You saying it to your kids isn't enough because at some point they're going to say, Oh, well, that's just my mom. She has to say that. Mm, that's just my dad. She has to say, and my youth leader saying that may not be enough. This is what we know for, for most people is your habits are what form your identity. And so by taking your kids and saying, Hey, we're the kind of people we go to church or we're the kind of people we pray. We're the kind of people we read the Bible. We're the kind of people we serve people. We, you get them living out the kingdom of God before they can understand it. You tell them, hey, youth group does matter. And I know you don't know who you are, but but we go to youth group. Uh, you know, children's ministry, it matters. I want my kids there because that routine, when they feel like I need to go find myself, and you say, hey, but you know who you are. You're the kind of kid who serves the poor. You're the kind of kid who loves those who no one else will love. You're the kind of kid who accepts those who won't be accepted. That's who you are because you're doing those things. And I think that is just a huge way for us to help root our kids in life with God. And there's nothing you can do that will magically make it happen because at some point they have to make the decision for themselves. But as, so if you're a parent and you got older kids and you're like, oh man, I blew this up. Oh, I did it wrong. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you did it right. And your kid just chose differently for themselves. There is nothing we can do. Every person, and I, this was huge to me, there's no way to keep your kids, there's no way to raise a child to be completely selfless. Uh, they have to have a self to lose. They have to have a life to give up for Christ. So every kid is going to go through this process. Our job as parents is to be loving guides 
to just love them and to continually through our life point them towards Jesus. And that's what we hope you do by watching these movies, by having these conversations. Uh, Thank you guys for listening to this conversation. We love you. We uh, wish you luck in your conversations, leading your children to love Jesus and his way of life even more. We'll see you next week.